So when it comes to controversies, few groups top the love or hate dichotomy quite as well as people for the ethical treatment of animals or PETA. From targeting children with its anti-meat and dairy marketing to the shock fact that PETA has euthanized over 19,000 dogs and cats since 1992 and counting, PETA has been mired in controversy since its inception. And while you'll find dozens of videos and articles detailing PETA's activities, fewer articles focus on the mysterious British activist, Ingrid Newkirk, who founded the operation with the assistance of a few friends in her basement. And although she's turning 70 sometime this month in June, she continues to make headlines as PETA's leader of the organization. Perhaps the most controversial figure in the history of animal rights activism, Newkirk's history is shrouded in contempt, secrets, and even allegations of domestic terrorism, something we've discussed in an earlier video. Newkirk's story is the embodiment of the phrase, the road to hell is paved with good intentions. And although she may have begun her journey as a woman looking to end animal cruelty, diving into the depths of extremism have twisted her message and permanently altered the history of animal rights activism. But is Newkirk really the evil figure she's often made out to be? Or is she just a woman on a mission who happened to fall down the slippery slope of extremism and who's become the media scapegoat for the quintessential preachy vegan? So hello everybody, and welcome back to the channel. My name is Blair or the Illuminati, and you guys have guessed it, we are taking another look at PETA. Ingrid has always been that weird shadowy figure in the back of all my videos that I've referenced or mentioned to or said some of the crazy things she said, but I've never quite dug into who she is as a person. And today we'll be going down the twisting wild rabbit hole that is the life of Ingrid Newkirk, the infamous founder of PETA and one of the most notorious CEOs in the world. Let's get into it. So who exactly is she? Though most people associate Newkirk with her organization PETA and its attention-seeking public stunts, Newkirk didn't feel any calling to fight on behalf of animals or animal welfare until she was in her early 20s. Newkirk was born in Surrey, England and lived in Europe until she was about seven years old. At this time, her parents relocated to New Delhi in India where her father worked as an engineer. When she was a teenager, she moved to Maryland in the United States. In 1972, a basket of abandoned kittens would change the path of Ingrid's life forever. While studying to be a stockbroker, Newkirk had found an abandoned cat and her kittens. She took the animals to a local shelter who told her the cats would be put down. Newkirk misunderstood the phrase and assumed that the shelter worker meant that the cats would be put up for adoption. When she asked to see them just minutes later, she was shell-shocked to hear that the cats she'd care for and brought in had been immediately euthanized. When I arrived at the shelter, the woman said, come in the back and we will just put them down here. I thought, how nice, you will set them up with a place to live. So I waited out front for a while and then I asked if I could go back and see them. And the woman just looked at me and said, what are you talking about? They are all dead. Shocked and disheartened by the experience, Newkirk quit school and got a job in the shelter in hopes of eventually changing some of the agency's policies. Unfortunately, the job gave her little more than an in-depth look at abuse and cruel conditions dogs and cats were being put under. According to Newkirk, the conditions dogs and cats lived in at the shelter ranged from inhumane at best to downright sadistic at worst. I went to the front office all the time and I would say, John is kicking the dogs and putting them into freezers. Or I would say they are stepping on the animals, crushing them like grapes and they don't care. In the end, I would go to work early before anyone got there and I would just kill the animals myself because I couldn't stand to let them go through that. I must have killed a thousand of them, sometimes dozens every day. Some of those people would take pleasure in making them suffer. Driving home every night, I would just cry thinking about it. And I just felt to my bones, this cannot be right. You might've seen a meme floating around cutting this quote out of context and making it seem like Newkirk took pleasure in euthanizing the animals herself, but that's the actual entire context of it. And although this might fit well with the narrative that PETA takes pleasure in killing abandoned animals with the quote tang out of context, the truth is it isn't. And although it is true that PETA is responsible for euthanizing thousands of animals every year and that the organization has gone on record opposing no-kill shelters, Newkirk was making a reference to the mercy killing she was forced to do while working at the shelter. The experience at that first animal shelter would set Newkirk on her lifelong crusade for the rights of animals in motion. As you see, Newkirk's intentions were spurred by good intentions. After seeing animals regularly abused and attacked by staff who were supposed to be protecting them, most people would feel like they would have to do something to help. But after forming PETA, Newkirk's bread and butter would go from investigative journalism to public stunts for attention. 
If you aren't familiar with the history of PETA, you might not be aware that the animal rights organization hasn't always trafficked and thrown paint on fur coats and staged protests in public areas. PETA began primarily dealing in undercover operations and was more of a journalistic operation before anything else. Founded by a group of ragtag university students in 1980, PETA was formed after Newkirk met fellow animal rights activist, Alex Pacheco. Pacheco would be the one to eventually introduce Newkirk to the concept of animal rights and veganism, two ideas that were basically unheard of outside very niche circles in the early 1980s. PETA's first major act of animal rights activism and undercover journalism was the case of the Silver Spring Monkeys. The Silver Spring Monkeys were 17 wild-born macaque monkeys from the Philippines that were brought to the United States and held in the Institute for Behavioral Research in Silver Spring, Maryland to be used as research subjects in the area of neuroplasticity. Neuroplasticity is basically the study of the brain's ability to reorganize its pathways and change over time, especially after a traumatic injury. The Silver Spring Monkeys were the subject of an experiment by psychologist Edward Tabb, who sliced the different ganglia of each of the monkeys' brains. The efferent ganglia is a cluster of nerves connected to the spinal column in mammals. When the afferent ganglia cluster is damaged or severed, the person or animal often loses feelings in their arms because the brain can no longer send electrical impulses to the limbs. With the nerve endings cut off from the brain, Tab's goal was to see if the monkeys could learn how to control limbs that they no longer felt. To accomplish this, researchers cut the neural connection to one of each of the monkey's arms, but not the other. Tab hypothesized that the monkeys were psychologically able to use an arm they no longer had feeling in, but elected not to because they still had control over a working arm that had feelings that weren't cut off from the rest of the body. To demonstrate this, Tab sliced the ganglia of one arm and restrained the other in a type of metal sling. To prevent the monkeys from chewing their differentiated arm off, researchers restrained the animals in a type of metal rack that looked less of a science lab experiment and more of some kind of medieval torture device. Even the most anti-PETA person in the world, myself probably one of them, would agree that the conditions the monkeys were kept in were at best inhumane and borderline sadistic at worst. Tab had no form of training as a veterinarian or animal keeper and did not hire a veterinarian to care for the animal wounds or illnesses in the lab. Tab would consistently starve the monkeys or electrocute them with prods in order to encourage them to use the limb that had been cut off from the brain. The sanitation of the monkeys' cages were of no concern to researchers who often left them caked with the monkeys' own feces for years on end. The cages themselves were also super unsafe and monkeys often caught their limbs and fur on the wiring of the containers drawing blood. No one bothered to bandage the monkeys' injuries properly on the few occasions when bandages were used at all and antibiotics were administered only once, no lacerations or self-amputation injuries were ever cleaned. When a bandage was applied, it was never changed, no matter how filthy or soiled it became. They were left on until they deteriorated to the point where they fell off the injured limb. Old, rotted fragments of bandage were stuck to cage floors where they collected urine and feces. The monkeys also suffered from a variety of wounds that were self-inflicted or inflicted by monkeys grabbing at them from adjoining cages. I saw discolored exposed muscle tissue on their arms. In one experiment, monkeys were locked in a sealed refrigerator and then repeatedly electrocuted until they used their disabled arm. This is particularly crazy because when the experiment began, the dominant theory in the world of neuroplasty was that animals were physically unable to use their non-functional arm. He had no idea if the monkeys were electing not to use that arm or if they just couldn't do what was required of them to stop the electrocution. That would be kind of like if I told you to jump three feet in the air right now or I'm going to tase you. Sure, you might be able to do it, but there's also a pretty good chance you're going to end up getting zapped. A graduate student at George Washington University, Alex Pacheco volunteered to work as an unpaid volunteer in Tab's lab in order to gain a firsthand perspective of exactly how research animals were kept during and after testing. Shocked by the conditions, Pacheco snuck a camera into the laboratory and photographed the monkey's living conditions, which he then brought back to Newkirk. PETA passed the photos on to the police who conducted their first ever animal cruelty raid on a research facility on September 11th, 1981. Police who conducted the raid reported being just as shocked and appalled as Pacheco and Newkirk were when they first learned of the mistreatment. Head of the Montgomery County Police Force, Lieutenant Richard Swain said the following. 
It was absolutely filthy, just incredibly dirty, like nothing I've ever seen. I've executed lots and lots of search warrants. I've worked in murder, in narcotics, in vice, but this was the first time I went into a room and I felt legitimately concerned for my health just being there. Tab was eventually tried and convicted of multiple counts of animal cruelty. Though all the convictions would later be overturned in an appeal, the case of the Silver Spring Monkeys would eventually lead to a national media outrage and new laws concerning research, animal treatment, and the types of experiments that can and cannot be conducted on animals. It would also catapult PETA's status from a nameless group of five university students in a basement to a household name. While this might seem like an open and shut case of animal cruelty, one particular note struck me when I was researching the story of the Silver Spring Monkeys and how PETA released its evidence. Newkirk and Pacheco didn't just submit their evidence to the police and wait for justice to arrive. They also leaked the story to the press before the Montgomery police had a chance to infiltrate the facility. PETA had called multiple press outlets the day before the raid. As a result, the police were greeted with crowds of reporters, cameramen, and assorted animal rights activists handing out pamphlets. Revealing that a raid would be happening is actually against Maryland law. And Lieutenant Swaim didn't hide his displeasure when asked about the appearance of the press during the raid. I was mad, Swain recalls. It wasn't appropriate. In fact, it's illegal in Maryland to divulge the existence of a search warrant. To outsiders, this may seem like a pedantic detail. After the raid had occurred, the press would inevitably find out what happened from police reports and eyewitness accounts. Who cares if they found out that a raid happened 24 hours or so early? The truth is that there's a reason why it's illegal to make public knowledge that a raid will be conducted. Police need to wait for the court to approve a search warrant before they can legally enter a home or business to conduct a search. This can take days, weeks, and sometimes even months, depending on the needs of the police and how busy the courts are. If the facility had been tipped off about the upcoming raid before police had the chance to get their search warrant, they could have had a chance to clean up their act, so to speak, before the Montgomery police had a chance to serve justice. This might've been PETA's first major foray into active action against animal cruelty, but it was also the first sign that Newkirk had no problem bending the rules of the law in order to make a point. We will see Newkirk drastically escalate this concept with future PETA stunts, eventually leading to a split between Newkirk and Pacheco, who would no longer stand Newkirk's leadership choices. I'm often asked, why did you part from PETA? Was it a fundamental issue and, or do you feel the actions by PETA were justified? The short answer is, I left PETA because it had and has drifted far from its base and because of disagreements over tactics. Over time, she began to introduce the investigative work, mostly because it costs a lot of time and began replacing it with what I call stupid human tricks. This caused friction between us. But these stupid human tricks, as he said, would eventually become the least of Newkirk's problems when it came to public image. The Animal Liberation Front, or ALF for short, is a leaderless animal liberation group that supports direct action to eliminate animal cruelty. This direct action can include everything from nonviolent means of action like peaceful protests and sit-ins to violent crimes like arson, destruction of property, and assault. Because the group doesn't have a formal organization or hierarchy, actions committed on behalf of ALF can vary wildly depending on the cause and individual. ALF has claimed that the group doesn't support violent actions or actions that are against the law. Despite this, many government officials and media outlets have condemned ALF for their failure to condemn violent attacks, many of which involve destroying property with fire. According to the Southern Poverty Law Center and the FBI, the Animal Liberation Front, alongside another group, the Earth Liberation Front, otherwise known as ELF, committed more than 600 criminal acts between the years of 1996 to 2002 alone. The groups also caused more than $43 million in damages. The FBI labeled ELF as a special interest domestic terrorist organization in 2004. During the past several years, however, special interest extremism as characterized by Animal Liberation Front and Earth Liberation Front and related extremists has emerged as a serious domestic terrorist threat. Individuals within the movement have discussed actively targeting food producers, biomedical researchers, and even law enforcement with physical harm. But even more disturbing is the recent employment of improvised explosive devices against computer product testing companies accompanied by threats of more, larger bombings, and even potential assassinations of researchers, corporate officers, and employees. 
ALF has claimed responsibility for a very wide range of attacks considered by law enforcement officials to be acts of domestic terrorism. For example, in July of 2002, animal rights activists who claimed to be associated with ALF set off smoke bombs in two downtown Seattle buildings, sending over 700 office workers fleeing into the streets. The buildings were targeted because they housed insurance companies providing policies to Huntingdon Life Services, a research company that conducts animal testing. It's important to note that ALF claims to never have directly harmed or killed a human, that they only target empty properties with arson attacks. However, the group's reckless abandon has directly injured thousands of human beings, and it's pretty safe to assume that it's only a matter of time before someone inevitably is killed by one of ALF's raids or attacks. I can't believe this is something I have to say, but there is no amount of safe arson. Ingrid Newkirk has caught heavy criticism for her outspoken support of ALF. Newkirk has been accused of supporting the organization using a number of channels, ranging from publicizing and celebrating attacks to allocating donated funds towards underground ALF activities. Newkirk believes that ALF is akin to the Underground Railroad that helped freed slaves brought to the United States, and she has consistently condoned the violence committed by the organization. Not until black demonstrators resorted to violence did the national government work seriously for civil rights legislation. In 1850, white abolitionists, having given up on peaceful means, began to encourage and engage in actions that disrupted plantation operations and liberated slaves. Was that all wrong? The PETA website doesn't even shy away from condoning the violence committed by ALF. Throughout history, some people have felt the need to break the law in order to fight injustice. The Underground Railroad and the French Resistance are both examples of people breaking the law in order to combat injustice. PETA is a legal activist organization, but we realize that other groups have different methods and we try not to condemn any efforts in behalf of animals in which no one is harmed. The ALF, which is simply the name adopted by people acting illegally in behalf of animal rights, breaks inanimate objects such as stereotaxic devices and decapacitators in order to save lives. It burns empty buildings in which animals are tortured and killed. Anyone can be an activist. It does not take any special skills or superhuman abilities. You just need to care enough about animals to want to help them. Another important note, when pressed, Newkirk has claimed that she doesn't support the acts of arson committed by the Animal Liberation Front, but her denial is unconvincing at best. I do support getting animals out in the same way I would have supported getting human slaves out, child labor, sex slaves, the whole lot. But I don't support burning. I don't support arson. I would rather that these buildings weren't standing, so on some level, I understand. I just don't like the idea of that. Now, obviously I can't get inside Newkirk's head, so I can't say for certain that she's lying, but I'm just throwing this out there. If you need to add addendums to the phrase, I don't support arson, I'm not sure it's a very far stretch to say that you might just possibly be okay with a tiny bit of arson. Newkirk's direct association with the ALF is murky and steeped in confusing contradictions, but there's no question that Newkirk has publicly come out in support of the ALF. In 1992, Newkirk wrote a truly bizarre 400 page book called Free the Animals, the amazing true story of the Animal Liberation Front in North America. The ostensibly nonfiction book tells the story of Valerie, a former police officer who was responsible for founding the first American chapter of ALF after being called to action by PETA's Silver Spring Monkey case. The authenticity of the account has been questioned numerous times. Joe Shoesmith, a longtime animal activist and a core founding member of PETA, claims that Valerie is totally fictitious. Newkirk has admitted that the account was fictionalized for narrative effect, but hasn't admitted that the story has been completely fabricated as Shoesmith claims. It's impossible to tell who is exactly telling the truth. As ALF's origins in the United States are murky, the fact that Newkirk titled her book an amazing true story doesn't exactly help her case. Newkirk has also been accused of having prior knowledge of at least one ALF attack and failing to report that action to the police. In 1995, ALF operative Rod Coronado, someone we've talked about before, was tried and convicted of arson and felony conspiracy following attacks on Michigan State University research facilities. The attack caused $125,000 worth of damage and destroyed an estimated 32 years of research data. During the trial, US attorney Michael Detmer accused Newkirk of having prior knowledge that the attack would occur and urging Coronado to send her stolen documents from the laboratory and a videotape of the attack. 
Forensic evidence discovered during the investigation confirmed that Coronado played an important role in planning and executing ALF's campaign of terrorism. Investigators learned that immediately before and after the MSU arson, a Federal Express package had been sent to a Bethesda, Maryland address from an individual identifying himself as Leonard Robideau. The first package went to Ingrid Newkirk, PETA's founder. The second package was intercepted by employees of Federal Express after they discovered that a phony account number had been used to send the package. The second package contained documents that had been stolen from MSU researcher, Dr. Alric's lab, also a videotape of a perpetrator of the MSU crime disguised in a ski mask. So what was in the first package? Well, the first package was intercepted by a longtime PETA member named Maria Blanton after being asked to receive it by Newkirk herself. Investigators received a search warrant to search Blanton's home where they found much more than the contents of the package. Surveillance logs, code names for Coronado and other operatives, night vision goggles, phony identification for Coronado, and an assortment of burglary tools were seized from Blanton's home. However, much more curious than the physical contents of the package was the date that it was received. Newkirk had arranged to have the package of what appeared to be burglary and arson tools to her residence days before the arson attack occurred. How involved was Newkirk in the arson attack? Did she know about what would be sent in the packages? Or was Coronado just a crazy person attempting to impress his animal rights hero by sending proof of how committed he was to the cause? The answer is that we don't know, and police aren't 100% sure either. It is important to note that Newkirk was never charged with a crime or formally connected with the MSU attack, and this isn't the first time that Newkirk has been associated with video evidence created by the ALF. In 1984, Ingrid Newkirk and Alex Pacheco released a 26-minute film titled Unnecessary Fuss, which showed researchers from the University of Pennsylvania laughing at baboons as their heads were smashed from behind using a hydraulic device meant to simulate whiplash. The film was based on 60 hours of secretive footage recorded by ALF operatives during a raid on the University of Pennsylvania's head clinic. While this isn't hard evidence that Newkirk knew about the arson attack that would take place, it does show a pattern of behavior and an intimate connection to the ALF that most people and law enforcement agents would find very suspicious. Associations with domestic terrorism isn't the only reason why Newkirk is considered to be one of the most universally disliked CEOs on the planet. She has also drawn the ire of a number of other activist groups for her menagerie of offensive human animal suffering comparisons, public non sequiturs, and bizarre publicity stunts that seem to be much less about public animal welfare and much more about drawing attention to herself. Newkirk and PETA at large have been criticized numerous times for comparisons between animal consumption and the Holocaust. Newkirk has gone on record comparing the suffering animals go through within factory farming operations to that which Holocaust survivors endured during World War II. If a concentration camp or laboratory is burned, that is violence. But if it is left standing, is that not more or worse violence? Isn't the chicken house today's concentration camp? Or do we not believe that it is wrong to make victims and to deride and persecute those who we do not relate to? Will we condemn its destruction or condemn its existence? Which is the more violent wish? If you can guess which organization whose violence Newkirk is rationalizing in this quote, congratulations, you've been paying attention. Newkirk also oversaw the introduction of the astoundingly tone deaf Holocaust on your plate traveling display, which juxtaposed images of animals in factory farms with photos taken in concentration camps during the Holocaust. A German high court actually banned the exhibit unsurprisingly, chastising it for making the fate of the victims of the Holocaust appear banal and trivial. PETA's defense was that the exhibit was funded by a Jewish member of PETA. Frickin' yikes on trikes. They did eventually apologize for the display, but not before attempting to appeal the decision, which is just bonkers. And if you think that these stunts are all part of Newkirk's past, well, she keeps returning to prove that she's got a lot more to say. In 2014, Newkirk published her unique last will and testament that included a number of creative ways she wants her body to be disposed of. Among many, many suggestions, Newkirk asked that the meat of her body be used for a human barbecue, her skin be removed and made into leather products, and her eye be mounted and sent to the leader of the Environmental Protection Agency as a reminder that PETA will continue to be watching the agency until it stops poisoning and torturing animals in useless and cruel experiments. 
In fact, there's a suggested use for almost every one of her body parts. Her thumb will be mounted, pointing upwards and given to someone who has made a significant contribution to PETA approved alternatives to animal abuse. Her liver, vacuum sealed and shipped to France as a punishment for consuming so much foie gras, a specialty dish made from the liver of duck or goose. Her heart, a tiny chunk of it is to be buried near the Ferrari pits where German Formula One racer Michael Schumacher won the German Grand Prix. Why, you might ask? Just because Newkirk really, really likes F1 racing, apparently. Like, who knew? Did you watch Soylent Green and think, yeah, that, but with sweet baby rays? Well, I have some great news for you. Newkirk has also requested that her human barbecue be a public event. The official location will be up to the discretion of PETA. It could be at the National Pork Convention Rally or to protest the transport of animals along a highway. It might even be good to serve at a political event to say it's time to put vegetarian and vegan meals in the schools. Now, all jokes aside, the list of times Newkirk has drawn negative attention to herself and PETA is a mile long. And though many people think these stunts do much more to hurt the organization than to help it, one thing is very clear. When Newkirk does eventually pass, she'll be able to say that she literally lived and died for animals and PETA. As you can see, Ingrid Newkirk's life has been complicated to say the least. And though Newkirk does inevitably draw her fair share of online and media hate and bullies, not everyone sees her as the evil figure she's often portrayed to be by her detractors. Actor and comedian Alan Cummings, you know, that guy from the police show Instinct that got canceled in like one season, said this of Newkirk. Without Ingrid, who is an extraordinary woman, there would be no PETA, and without PETA, the animal rights movement would not be the global powerhouse that it is today. Ingrid has been at the forefront of this movement for 40 years and somehow maintains her sense of humor. Fun fact, he also hosted her 69th birthday party. Nice. Newkirk is well aware of her own infamy and the impact her actions have had on the reputation and media coverage of her organization. In this business, I am very easy to cubbyhole. As someone said to me the other day, they had seen the HBO special and they said, are you really a sad, obsessed person? And I thought, no, I'm not really a sad person, except when I lie awake at night in winter thinking about all the animals without shelter and then I am sad. Who wouldn't be? Wouldn't anyone be sad if they have a heart? It's just that I've seen so much. And while Newkirk might be self-aware, closely examining herself, her life and her legacy, it's kind of sad. Perhaps journalist Michael Spector summed up Newkirk best after comparing the animal rights activist against her history and background. Newkirk is well-read and she can be witty. When she is not proselytizing, denouncing, or attacking the 99% of humanity that sees the world differently from the way she does, she is good company. After years of detestable public behavior, however, she has the popular image of a monster. Whenever I mentioned her name to friends, they would recoil, and she becomes more disliked with every PETA stunt. She can't walk through an airport without accosting any woman who is wearing fur. She no longer takes vacations in tropical or poor countries like Mexico because I spend the whole time rescuing animals from their horrid owners. At the end of the day, Ingrid's history should be one of warning to anyone who's committed their life to a certain cause. Newkirk's history might not be as vile as clickbait YouTube channels and Buzzfeed articles might make it seem, but it's also not the clean, sterile portrayal of a woman who loves puppies and baby chicks that the PETA website tries to propagate either. Like most things, the truth isn't all black and white, but a shade of gray blurred with good intentions, terrible executions, and the inherent need to get loud to get a message across in our busy, constantly distracted world. No matter how you feel about PETA, veganism, or animal welfare in general, it's impossible to deny that her controversial activities and associations have changed the way people view her organization. PETA has always been under control of this person. No matter how much good the organization does in the future or what it does accomplish, Newkirk's legacy will always remain as the shadow in the background. Sure, PETA has achieved worldwide attention thanks, no doubt, in part to Newkirk's associations and infamy, but at what cost? 100 years from now, when people are looking back on the history of the people for the ethical treatment of animals and its CEO, will they remember the groundbreaking feats of journalism that Newkirk once did achieve? 
Or will they remember her history of creating public spectacles, disrespecting survivors of the Holocaust, potentially funding domestic terrorisms, or one of the any other dozens of lists of controversial statements or things in previous videos that I've covered? And more importantly, when Newkirk does pass the torch to the next leader of PETA, will they be able to repair the reputational damage that Newkirk brought to her once groundbreaking organization? Or will PETA go down in history the same way as ALF will, as a group of extremists who should be ignored and silenced? The only way to answer these questions is to wait and see what the future holds. But for now, one thing is certain. Newkirk doesn't seem to be softening her stances or hanging up her fighting gloves for the foreseeable future. And so with that being said, that's where I'm going to end today's video. Let me know your guys' thoughts in the comment section down below. I know PETA is a very controversial company and a lot of people have very strong sentiments for or against it. So let me know what you guys think about this history of the founder's CEO down below. If you liked today's video, make sure to hit that like button, subscribe if you're new and consider sharing the video around so that more people can learn about the history of PETA's CEO. And if you guys want even more content from me, you can pop open that description box. You're gonna find links to all of my social media, second channel for my puppy Casper, my collaboration channel with the rest of Sad Milk. Links for everything will be down below. So again, thank you so much for making it to another video. I love you guys so much and I'll see you in the next one. Bye.